Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV, and we are continuing our series of Battle of the Bulge shows. And today we are looking at the role of General Patton. And to do that, we will have our friend of the show, Kevin Hemel, coming back. He's done several things with me. Good friend. We always end up just talking about stuff because we're mates. Um, and I should point out right at the beginning that uh, the first volume of his trilogy of books about General Patton is out right now. I'm holding a copy of it now, Patton's War. The link is in the description below. And what's good, I'll just say this before he goes red, about Kevin's approach to General Patton is that he's neither kind of pro or anti. He just talks about General Patton, warts and all, good things, bad things. Some of the previous biographies have, have come down on the they love General Patton camp or they hate General Patton camp. What we want is an appraisal that's kind of neutral and fair and balanced and above all using primary sources and that's what kevin has done with his book there i also want to remind you of course that this series of shows is sponsored by battle maps so that is the company that provides prints of, of maps of omaha beach prints civil war prints revolutionary prints all sorts of historical uh, prints the link is in the description below and if you go there and use the world war ii tv promo code you get 20 percent off so that's a good start there but without further ado I'm going to bring in my friend, Kevin. So um, good afternoon, Kevin. How are you today? I'm doing great, Paul. How are you doing? Can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly, yes. Yeah. So it's good. So I um, hope you didn't get too too red in the face when I was praising your book there, but um, it, I did enjoy your book, and I can't wait for the next two volumes. So General Patton, The Ardennes, Battle of the Bulge, as you know, I always try and look for bad history or kind of popular history before I do these shows. And the internet this time of year, Battle of the Bold is in the news. It's all general pattern this, general pattern that, general pattern. So what we're going to do, or you're going to do, is take us through what general pattern was actually doing, where he was, what his role was in it, and kind of give me a balanced view. So um, uh, this will be in the third volume of your book, I guess, this chapter. No, actually, this will be in volume two. Volume two is going to cover him from the race across France in August until uh you know Metz and Nancy the fighting okay. along the border and then the battle of bulge as far as his uh you know retake you know the relief of Bastogne or the link up at Bastogne and then the drive north till December 31st right and then volume 3 is going to be everything from in 1945 okay so so it'll kind of a overlap a bit the two the next two volumes because obviously that that's the thing we talked about with peter gaddick adams is is when the, the various historians define the end of the battle of the bold because as we know it kind of morphs into something else so um but anyway well volume two brilliant so um how's the is, is the is the writing finished is it ready to go yet halfway through it where are you on the what's the state Stop of pressuring me man <laughs> <laughs> well if, no, I, if, the, if a mate of the, yours the, can't pressure the, you the, who can the the bulk of the writing is done. Uh, it just it's taking a lot of editing and uh, other source checking uh, to to complete volume two. It's due to the uh, publisher on March first. So um, and of course I'm a little uncomfortable talking about a book that hasn't come out yet. I don't want to give away all the secrets, but I I did some very revealing research into Patton and the Battle of the Bulge that you know I said I'd be willing to share because because you're my buddy. Um, so yeah, let's let's talk about that. But you know, just to, to to kind of rehash, by the time you get to the Battle of the Bulge, Patton is really one of our most experienced commanders. He's really kind of cut his teeth in North Africa and Sicily. Uh, he's been basically sitting on his hands, chomping at the bit, wanting to get into combat. And then he basically, I have to say, it's probably to me the most brilliant part of his career is the race across France because it kind of defies what everybody thinks the American army or any kind of army is capable of. Um, and the, the fighting that follows along the border is very conventional. And what he does in the opening stages of the bulge, at least, is, is pr pretty impressive. But I honestly think it's that race across France that was really his greatest military moment. Superb stuff. So, you know, as you heard me say there, that we, you know, th these are just some things I looked up, you know, that the kind of articles that go around this time of year, pa General Patton relieves the Allies at Baston, Patton's finest hour. Under his decisive leadership, the Third Army took the lead in relieving beleaguered American troops at Baston during the Battle of the Bulge. And it seems to me, and we can talk about it as we get into it, the two primary things that come up in every reference to the Ardennes at this time of year is Baston 
and Patton. And as we've already established with some of the other shows, Baston, of course, is very important, but so is St. Vith, so is the Lanzareth Ridge, so is all the other places, so is the British British 53rd Division's involvement, etc., etc. We did the show with John Bernstein uh, I, on Friday about the, um, the Ninth Air Force, their pivotal role in there. So before we get into what you've researched, why do you think Patton and Baston have kind of captured the imagination? Is it because of the movies? Is it because of Patton's status? What, why do we associate the Ardennes with those two things particularly? Well, I think it has a lot, in some ways, American history, the idea of the settlers surrounded by hostile Indians and the cavalry marching in to save the day. It's got that sort of romantic bent to it. There's, there's no unimportant battle in the Ardennes campaign. You know, every battle is significant to stopping the Germans or slowing the Germans, but it's that, that imagery of this one individual commander uh, going swimming upstream against all odds to relieve the beleaguered troops, you know, in a surrounded, uh, you know, town, no matter how elite they are, you know. And, and I think where so much of the bulge is static defensive fighting, you know, and that's that was the, the concept that, that um, Field Marshal Montgomery had was let them break themselves on the rocks of our defenses yep. and then we'll go on the attack where Patton's philosophy was the immediate counterattack. So I think that that motion, that, that seamless of victory that early in the campaign really does capture a lot of imaginations. And by this point in the war, too, Patton is such an established name. You know, you would say the American First Army did this, and then Patton's Third Army did that. You know, his name just in the just when reporters would talk, they would drop his name and anything associated with him. So this to be that most identified general, and then to go on this important campaign, it just it, it's it's like a magnet or something like drawing all the gravity like a black hole towards it. And that was the sort of atmosphere Patton created on the battlefield. No, I agree. I mean, you, you made a very astute point there that it is always Patton's third army as opposed to the third army. And for whatever reason, his own um, promotion, the, the fact the press just liked him because he was colorful and gave a good quote, his other units that are fighting their way across France, their their commanders didn't didn't need or didn't feel it was important to be in the, in in the headlines and for whatever reason Patton like Montgomery like other commanders we can think of there's a there's a there's a, a, a part of them that likes being at the forefront of the publicity as well as being at the forefront of the battle but let's get back to let's imagine it was the middle of November end of November 1944 so where was general patton at that time and what was he thinking was going to happen because we discussed with peter caddick adams on monday that the allies are all generally assuming that nothing's really going to happen for the next few weeks because it's winter the germans haven't got the strength to mount a counteroffensive is that what General Patton is thinking and his staff are thinking? Are they are they similarly focused, or does he have an inkling that anything else is happening? And well, well and where right. was no, he? No, he's pretty much in lockstep with everybody else. He has just finished. He's he's launched two back to back campaigns: the campaign to take Metz, which he launches on November seventh, and then the campaign to get to the Saar River. And so basically, it's one big campaign, but. You know, he basically does a pincer movement surrounding Metz and then has his armored units just continuing on to the Saar River while his infantry basically crushes Metz and all the resistance. And so he gets to the Saar River and he's planning an operation called Operation Tink. And this is kind of similar to Operation Cobra, where the Air Force or the Army Air Force's bombs a carpet bombs, you know, a rectangular piece of ground destroying everything there to allow the allies to break through. Operation Tink is similar to that, but it's gonna be a three day campaign. And instead of this box area, they're gonna bomb German strong points and slowly move the bombing west ahead of third army. And that's really his great focus. So um, if you'll let me go off on a diatribe, um, you, we were saying, you know, did he have any inkling? And that is, something I've always believed and I've always read about that Patton predicted the Battle of the Bulge, that he did foresee this great German attack. 
And you can, there, then historians point to about two or three different factors uh, regarding that. I'm going to move this uh, iPad away that keeps dinging. Um, and in my research, I found that not only did Patton not predict the bulge, he is very surprised by it. And I know that's going to cause a lot of stir because that's probably one of the things he's most famous for. Um, but I, I, uh, all the research I've done uh, draws me back to this conclusion. So let me just start that everybody who says that Patton predicted the bulge refers to his typed transcribed diary, the entries on November 25th. Now remember the Battle of the Bulge is December 16th. Um, there it is. And if you see there's that line in there and it's, to be honest with you, Paul, the screen is too small for me to see. So I'm gonna kind of wing it, but he has that line in there that, um, what is it, uh, Middleton's core is kind of sticking out and um, you know, and that and the Germans can take advantage. And then there's an asterisk. And if you go down to the bottom of the page, his wife said, "This is the von Rundstedt, where von Rundstedt attacks three weeks later." And so you're like, "Wow, Patton really saw that Middleton was kind of had, had dropped the ball." You know, he's seeing the exact spot where the bulge battle is going to take place. Um, brilliant, Patton's genius proved right there for everybody. Well, the, the truth of the matter is when Beatrice transcribed his diaries, she did embellish them. And so I went back to the written diaries. And if you can go to that, that sentence is not there. His great prediction in his handwritten diary is not there. And what I discovered in the handwritten diaries, I think it's December 29th. So Bastogne's been relieved. And Patton put a line in his diary then that Middleton should not have been so slack with his core. And so what it seems to me is that Beatrice took that sentence from December 29th and moved it back to November 25th. And to me, that's your first clue that Patton didn't predict mm. the bulge. Now, some other pieces of evidence. Um, Patton's G2. Um, uh, Oscar Koch. He yeah, well, and just, just an, an, sorry to interrupt this. you, but Trent Talenko asked, are you going to mention um, Colonel Cox? Koch? So um, good. So uh, yeah, the answer good. is no, no, now I'm not going to. Look, now, now you've been asked to do it. You're not going to. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Oscar Koch said, Patton approached us and said, listen, I, I suspect that the Germans are building up north of us. Send reconnaissance flights to the north because I have a feeling they're going to launch some kind of attack. Um, and so that is a statement, and I need to do a little bit more research on it. It looks like Koch wrote that in the 1950s, after World War II, after this rumor has you know kind of gone out about him predicting it. So what really happened, I mentioned Operation Tink. This is that bombing campaign. And the idea is Patton is going to launch two corps at the Germans while the bombing's going on. Then he's gonna take a rookie core, the third core, and blast it up the middle, you know, like, like a typical football play. And his worry is that he's gonna get flanked from the north and the Germans are gonna flank him. That's why he's got Oscar Koch looking north. He's not predicting the bulge, he's concerned with his own offensive. Now, Koch says, you know, oh, we saw this buildup, we were really worried about it, we told Patton this. So, okay, that makes perfect sense. But I went through all of the G2 intelligence records for Third Army, and they they do them daily, and they're pretty thick. And some other historians have quoted like, oh, he said this armored division looks kind of strong, and there's your evidence. Well, I went to the summaries at the end of every single uh, assessment, and every single one said, the Germans are capable of small attacks but nothing on a major scale. They've lost too many tanks and too many men. And this is from December 1st to December 16th, the day they launched the attack. Patton's intelligence is telling him the Germans are incapable of a major offensive. Okay? So that's the next piece of, of evidence that I've found. Um, and then the third piece, and now this is something Martin Blumenson put forward, is that Patton was supposed to move his headquarters to our law but he kept putting it off. And Blumenson said, well, this is evidence that Patton knew something big was coming 
and he didn't want to be caught moving his headquarters to our law. He knew because he knew this big attack is coming. Well, what the truth is, is Patton was going to move his headquarters to our law and he was sending staff officers to go pick out a new headquarters. And they would get to our law and they'd see a building and they're like, you know, that's that's pretty much going to be it. There's our new headquarters. We'll move in tomorrow. Boom, the building blew up. The Germans had planted delay fuse mines all over our law and other towns as they because they were experts at retreating from the you know experience on the Russian front. And so they would fight, pull back, and leave all these delayed few bombs. And so this happened to, to Colonel Codman, you know, seeing several buildings blow up, and they just said, We can't move into this town yet. It's you know, there's too many unexploded bombs. That's why Patton didn't move his headquarters. It was nothing to do with intuition about the bulge. And then I guess the biggest piece of evidence, well, there's two more pieces of evidence, and these are out in the open if you read his diaries. When Bradley calls and he says, move 10th Armor North because there's something going on in the Ardennes, Patton reluctantly agrees, hangs up the phone, then calls his corps and division commanders because he's got the third corps in the rear, with the 4th Armored, the 26th, and the 80th Infantry Divisions. They're, 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 you know, resting up. They're getting replacements. They're getting their ammo together because they're going to make this punch to the east. Well, now suddenly there's a desperation call from the north. And so what does Patton do? He tells the, the three division commanders, get your asses east and get occupied so you don't get sucked up into this battle. If Patton predicted the battle, the bulge, he would have been ready. You know, when, when, as soon as they, they knew there was fighting going north, but he ran away from the sound of the guns, not to the sound of the guns. And um, Peter Caddick Adams book actually had a good part, piece about the Germans saying, I think it was Brandenburg. He says, hey, when we go on this offensive, Patton can turn immediately and attack us. Well, Brandenburg had more faith in Patton than Patton did because he had Patton attacking at least four days earlier than his attack. Wow. And if Patton had stayed still, he would have attacked exactly when Brandenburg had said it. So that's the evidence I've seen so far. And then the last piece, uh, and Bradley's very honest about this too. On December 18th, Bradley calls Patton to his headquarters and he shows him the map and Patton is shocked. He said, I knew something was going on. I didn't know it was this bad as he's looking at the map. And it's at that moment that Patton says, okay, this is bad. I need to do something. And it's that point that the wheels start turning, you know, the mind starts going. He's on the phone with the staff. They're building the contingency plans. So as much as I hate to say it, Patton did not predict the bulge and was surprised just as much as anyone else. Well, and, and on that bombshell, we could just end the show now. But I mean, we won't. Um, but the point is, I mean, what my questions are. So. To recap, he's ready for his own offensive, a Cobra-like offensive. So that means he he is preparing his uh, army for an aggressive action. Uh, the second thing is there is no evidence you said there. You cited several bits, and I'm sure there'll be more in the book about why he didn't predict it. But where, therefore, did this start? You said that you know the, the diaries were kind of edited a little bit, but... Was it the press? When did this idea that he'd predicted it first take seed? Was it during the war? Was it after war? I mean, obviously, we've got the moments in the in the in the pattern of film there. I, I just thought I'd grab the the stills there of where the way it's set up in the movie is general pattern just seems to everyone else has no idea what's going on. He's sitting there and he's confident, kind of he doesn't say, I knew about this, and he says, I'll have my army there in 48 hours. And that's 1970. That can't be where it started. What, no. What's your What's your idea of where it began? During the war or after the war? Who started it? It's after the war. Um, and I believe it's Beatrice because they published that book, you know, uh, War As I Knew It, right after the war. And she has done the editing, the predictions in there. She's done her homework. She's gone back to the diaries, you know, and added that. And that's why it's in, you know, Lumminson's book, Carlo Deste's book, uh, um, uh, Farago's book. So it really is, that there's nothing, nothing that I've seen during the war talks about him predicting it. And uh, what's interesting is Omar Bradley in his memoir, he was like, you know, it, it, George never said anything to us. Like if he knew this was coming, why didn't he tell me 
you know, because I could have done something about it as Army Group Commander. But yeah. for some reason, he predicted, but never so. Omar Bradley was even under the ship because I think when Omar Bradley read Patton's memoir um, and all that information comes out, he was surprised. Like, you know, I didn't know this. And, you know, I'm just thinking about it now. Patton badmouths a lot of generals in his memoir and throws a lot under the bus. And to do that, he's got to prove that he's right and he understands what's going on in the battlefield better than anyone else. And at times he did. But maybe Beatrice realized that I need to put him on a higher level so that it'll justify criticizing Bradley not being oh, ready right. for the Battle yeah. of the Bulge. And so maybe that had something to do with it. But it's really her picking up that ball. And I, I got to say, Paul, and you probably feel the same way. A lot of people do. It's fascinating to think that he predicted it. And so I know that in my old writings, I went along with it, you know, and I could look, I could point to any book and say, look, the, and I think Deste and Blumenson were just as fascinated by the concept and looked to reinforce it. And I really had to pull a blank slate when I saw that the diary entry was false and had to start unthinking everything and, and, and then sort of doing the history from the ground up. You know, yeah. it, because very rarely do you hear a uh, reference to Operation Tink. I had to contact the Air Force Research Agency down in Alabama to get the, the actual operational orders to, to, to get my mind around it. And I had to sit there with the operational orders and, a, and I printed out a map and traced all the bombings to see how it would go. There's so little on Operation Tink, but it's a brilliant move by, by General Weiland, the one-star general, because all the four-star Air Force generals are saying, we're running out of targets. And he says, well, why don't we redo Cobra? And Patton's all on board. But, but then if you press Tink, it takes away from that image of Patton predicting the bulge. So yeah. they sacrifice that so that Patton would look even better. I mean, that's just, it's just really fascinating. And it's, we've talked about it so often on World War II TV in recent weeks, this idea of we've now coming up for nearly 80 years of historiography now. So we have this database of, of what we used to think in this decade and what was piled onto on that. And it's kind of confirmation bias. If people, the, the first big history, I mean, Carlo Deste and Blumenson, they were big names. These guys still carry a lot of weight. Their research was still good. They still, their books are still worth reading and having, but it was, as you say, it was just confirming what they wanted to think. Yeah. But as you said there, the weird thing is, which you made me think about it, is if he had predicted it, predicting it and then not telling anybody just makes him a bit of a dick, doesn't it? I mean, if if you really have got that suspicion, you just, you're just you're an army commander. Just get on the telephone. Just run it by a couple of your mates. Just say, I've got a hunch, Brad. I've got a hunch, Dwight, whatever it would be. You know, it's holding it back just so you can become the hero is a bit of a would be a weird move. Do you know how many times he called Bradley complaining about gas and Eisenhower complaining about lack of supplies? He was on the phone with them every day. And it's like, but you see this great thing coming and you see a tidal wave coming towards and you're not telling us to run for higher ground, you know? But, uh, you know, and I don't know if I've talked to you about this before. I, I've talked to John McManus about how, you know, history, you know, you say it's written by the victors, but it's really the memoirs of the people there. And that's what yeah. we work off of. And then the sort of the next generation is still in awe of those veterans because they're all still alive. And that's where you get the Ambrose and the Brokaws, you know, the greatest generation uh, stuff. And then you get to that next generation and you see the same thing in the American Civil War and the American Revolution where they're praised as gods and then it becomes more pragmatic, you know. And I think that's where we're getting to with World War II is people like myself are going back to the records and saying, okay, this these stories they told us that didn't happen. They were covering their butts, you yeah. know. And and you and you can see that in volume one of my book, you know, where Dick Jetson gets killed ten feet from Patton. Thank you very much. <laughs> Keep doing that throughout the whole talk. But but you know, it's like I've got to save my career. Let's say Dick Jensen was killed miles and miles away. You know, Omar Bradley. Oh, I fired Terry Allen because he was out of control. No, Patton did it, and he, and he wasn't even relieved of command. He was rotated, you know, so you you have to discipline yourself because even when I was reading these things, in my mind, I knew how it really went because I'd seen the movie, you mm. know, and it's like, no, you got to start with a clean slate 
and do the primary research. And that's where you get the real, and the real stories get even more fascinating. You know, well, that, that's that's the ridiculous thing, isn't it? That is the the truth is always going to be more fascinating because it's the truth. And you know, you you were just saying there about the these these great people, the Blumensons, and later on the Brokars and the Ambroses. I mean, those early generation of books, it was mostly memoirs by generals, and it was that journalistic approach, the Chester Wilmot, um, 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 Cornelius Ryan kind of approach, where they were taking stories from people they'd interviewed, which were left us with very, very vivid accounts of what happened. But there's that gap between the general's memoirs and the journalist that is filled in with what you've been doing and John McManus and all these other doing and Peter Caddick Adams and Philip Blood is watching is just going back to the data, going back to the documentation that, that it seems to me that the people writing in the 50s and 60s just didn't really care about documentation. It was just sitting with generals and writing down what they said. And 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 now we're at the position with this, say, this 80 years of historiography. We can look back and go, these are the trends. This this is what was happening in this decade, and this is what's happening now. So so we've established he didn't predict it. So when when was he aware? When did Third Army headquarters get the first inkling that the Ardennes offensive was on and what was his first reaction? So, as I said, uh, December 18th, he goes to Omar Bradley's headquarters. By the way, one of my friends checked in. He said, hey, is that your old officer's cap behind you? That's why I went to military high school. Um, December 18th, he goes to Bradley's headquarters. He sees the map. He's shocked. Uh, he gets back to his headquarters pretty late. Um, but he, you know, and he tells the staff, go to bed because I need you fresh as daisies tomorrow morning. So um, he's already working the plans out, you know, at night when he gets back and he comes up with three ideas. One, cut the bulge off at its base, which is probably militarily the most sound. Um, number two, drive up for to Bastogne because he knows that it's, that troops are getting up there. It's a key crossroad. It's not surrounded yet, you know, um, and I and I haven't finished my research. I, I've written a lot about the Battle of Noville and some of the other battles, but I need to sit down. That's part of the book I really want to work on is what was going on in Bastogne when the meeting on the 19th started? What was right. going on in Bastogne by the time the meeting ended? Because things are happening so quickly up at Bastogne. You really need a timeline. In the movie, they say, you know, oh, they've got all these troops surrounded in Bastogne. I don't think that's right. At that point, we've rushed 101st there but we don't know that it's surrounded. So I'm sorry. So plan A, cut it off the base. Plan B, go to Bastogne. And plan C is to hit it in the nose, you know? And I don't think plan C was ever really seriously considered. Now, what you're looking at there, this is Patton's map after the 19th. He's promised that he will have Third Army ready to attack on December 22nd. So he's got to pull all these units that he is told to drive east and send them west and north. And you can see what an intricate plan this is, because not only are they moving back, they're actually picking up replacements as they go and new equipment. And that all has to be coordinated. And this all doesn't happen at once. You know, some of the divisions are going to move first and then some a little bit later. But he really does have them ready to attack on the 22nd. And if you look, uh, Paul, you know, we always talk about the relief of Bastogne. And you can see Bastogne is circled there. You can see all the red arrows going there. But if you look to the right, north of Luxembourg City, there's lots of troops heading up there, too. So Patton, even though that Eisenhower says, I want the, you know, Bastogne relieved, Patton doesn't want to do a single attack. it will give the Germans something to focus on. He's going to attack north of Luxembourg City. And this is something fa fascinating to me that I never really realized before because all the historians focus on the relief of Bastogne. But he sends Eddie's corps north and they get into fighting. And there's mm -hmm. some brutal fighting going on there during the race to Bastogne. You know, now once Bastogne is relieved, Patton wants to cut the thing off in half, but Omar Bradley doesn't. He wants to, you know, to, to drive north to Hoofley's where, you know, eventually First Army is going to start driving south. And what's amazing, so Patton relieves Bastogne on the 26th, the day after Christmas. And he basically says in his diary, OK, tomorrow we take Hoofalese. You know, he is very confident that Hoofalese is going to be captured in 24 hours. 
of course, we know it doesn't get captured until what, what January 14th, you know, so it, that's in a testament to how hard the Germans are fighting. I guess one of the things you got to realize too, Patton's third army is pretty exhausted when the battle of the bulge starts. Yeah. They have, you know, they've done the whole, uh, no November has been nothing but campaigning in rain and mud. Um, he, Eddie basically comes to him and he says, okay, now we're across the Saar River. We got to do Operation Tink. And Eddie comes to him and says, I, I don't think I can go on, you know, and Patton is, and, and, and Walker doesn't do it, but, um, you know, a lot of the division commanders are exhausted. And, you know, Patton is actually contemplating giving them a break because he said, you know, Eddie, spend the night at my place, you know, chill out. But, um, yeah, suddenly there's this huge German attack and all these exhausted guys have to go on the offensive. And it's, look at that brilliant looking book, man. Yeah, um, it is. I'll, I'll, do a, I'll, do a, I'll do a double one. I'll have that and I'll hold it up over here. So we've got it twice there. there we we can't see you now. There we are. <laughs> We might as well do the proper sales pitch, but um, but what? Okay, let's go back to this drive north because that's the thing. As I say, you know, I, I, this time of year is when the, the newspapers and the online history sites are doing the, you know, the Battle of the Bulge news stories. You know, five hundred words in a nutshell, blah blah blah, and it's always hundred and first nuts, passed on pattern. Um, you mentioned earlier about the Germans, the Brandenburg division, predicting that Patton's army or, or could have moved north was that because it was in the right location or because they thought that it was Patton and Patton would do it were they predicting it because of Patton's ability or because of where its location or a bit of both I would say a bit of both and uh according to Peter Caddick Adams book I got to give him the credit I haven't done the research enough on this that seventh army really doesn't have much armor and he's saying you're expecting me to hold the southern line without armor against their best armor commander you know, and so he's like, you know, guys, this isn't fair. We know, and they, and I believe that that was the discussion. We're up, we're going up against a guy who can move rapidly, who, you know, he, this is the guy that raced across France with all these tanks. And you're asking us to basically blaze a trail north of him and expect him not to do something about it, to sit there passively. And that's not going to happen. And they do predict that Patton is going to attack at least what I say about three days earlier than he actually did. So there was a healthy respect for Patton. Um, you know, there's there been books saying that the Germans really didn't care as much about Patton. And that's somewhat decent research, the studying German communiques. But I found that, you know, there was an incident during the Battle of Mayenne that a army captain steps between some German soldiers and their stacked rifles. And he says, hand a hoche, you know, put your hands up. And they don't do anything. And then in French, he says, you know, I'm with Patton. He has tanks, surrender. And they do surrender. So the Germans, the, the, low, the low infantry guys, they know, they know who Patton is. Uh, his reputation has preceded him. Um, another thing about this map. Now, this map I found in the Patton collection. You can see I just took a photograph of it with my camera at the time. But the, the, the thing that Patton praised the most, surprisingly to me, was General Bade's 35th Infantry Division, which is in the lower section because you can see the little six with a triangle for six armored um but it's the 35th that he said traveled the farthest and went on the attack i don't think they attacked on the 22nd they attacked on like the 23rd they were part of the follow-up attack behind fourth armored but they had moved the farthest distance and gotten into the battle and that that Patton pull, mentions bade several times and ironically um, you know, there was talk about firing. Well, there was almost talk about firing every division and corps commander at some point. Yeah, they all got exhausted. But um, yeah, and so that's the blueprint. And now Patton, for this movement, so he goes to this December 19th meeting with Eisenhower and Bradley when he promises to have the, all the troops online ready to go for the 22nd. He does not return to his base down in uh, Nancy or Nancy. You can see it on the map there. Um he stays in Luxembourg City and will spend the next two to three days basically with uh, Sergeant uh, Mims, the African-American aide, his Jeep driver, with a radio in the Jeep. And Pat is going to drive around the whole time on the radio with a map directing uh, Hap Gay down in Nancy, which roads, what divisions are going to use, how they're going to resupply, all of this in an open Jeep while driving around. And I just see account after account of like Patton sitting in a Jeep with a soldier eating lunch 
you know, Patton addressing the troops, Patton being here and there. And one of his staff members said that he went into Luxembourg City and all the American flags had been taken down. The streets are empty. You know, when you would see a person, they had a grimace on their face. Well, by the uh, the twenty the 20th, I think it was the 21st, the 5th Infantry Division starts getting up into Luxembourg City. And they said the people then just started flooding the streets, cheering, chanting, Patton, 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 you know, and then there's all these troops and tanks are suddenly just in just, you know, filling all the streets and everything. And this one officer said that they went to now Patton's going to set up his main headquarters at a place called the Pescatore, which is an old folks home. I know you've been to it and there's a nice plaque outside. Yeah. But some of his staff, they're, you know, on the other side of the city. And they occupy the same um, staff building as Omar Bradley's 12th Army Group, because that Luxembourg City is, pa- is Bradley's forward headquarters. And so um, these staff officers say that when they get up there, that the, the, they, that all the, the, the troops with all the, all the staff officers with 12th Army Group, they're all depressed. They're getting, they're getting documents ready for burning, you know, to pull, before they pull back. And he said, suddenly there's this flood of guys with, you know, third army patches and it changes the mood of Bradley's, you know, staff headquarters like that. And he said, you know, there's something about this patch that's good medicine for other Mm. troops. And so you just really get this sense of power and strength and optimism with Patton's movement. You know, yes, defensive warfare works in the face of an offensive and it gets the job done, but there's something you know, energizing about troops on the move, getting ready to attack, taking the fight to the enemy, that just, you, you just see revitalization everywhere Patton kind of touches. No, I, and I completely agree with that. But uh, well, just to kind of be devil's advocate there, Devil with the benefit of 77 years, and this meeting, folks, was 77 years ago today. That's when Patton and Brad, and uh, they're, all, they're having this conversation. But um, the, the commanders that are up, facing the the this german sixth panzer and fifth panzer and all those thrusts up there they're stuck with the fact they have an onslaught coming towards them whether they'd wanted to be aggressive or not they are now stuck with that defensive role a role that we can agree there were some amazing actions up there by the 99th even though the 106th got run over they held some of them held their ground the, you know that we could keep the 28th half coming out the Hurgan forest did did more than more than well in those early stages, despite the onslaught coming at them. It's just, it's, Patton must have been kind of pleased with hindsight that he was in a position to do the dynamic thing. Yeah. Because that, that that was just kind of, if you want to believe it, fate that put him in a position where he can do the dynamic drive. And as you said, he had been ready for Operation Tink. So he was, you know, he was thinking about going on. So it, it was all... The scene is set for him to do that dash there that may not have... It was circumstances that put him in that position more than his ability. He then used his ability to, to um, um, operate it well, but it was the, the circumstances favoured him to do something dynamic. You would agree yeah. on that, surely. Oh, completely. Yeah? You know, Paul, it kind of reminds me of when he takes over Second Corps in Tunisia. You know, you've got Eisenhower, who's exhausted, thinking he's going to be fired. Uh, for his failures on the battlefield. You've got his assistant or his chief of staff, Beetle Smith, who's suffering ulcers and has to go to England for treatment. You've got Lloyd Friedenhall, who's just completely overwhelmed. And so they call in Patton, who's been hunting and doing ceremonies in Morocco, well-rested, fresh. You know, it's like, no wonder he did well. He was in a better state of mind than these guys who were facing challenges they'd never faced before. And we're just burning themselves out. And here you got that again in the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah. That Patton's in that state of mind. He's kept fresh. Um, I would love to like cite certain chapters and stuff, but even th- throughout November and before it, he's so concentrated on setting up entertainment uh, centers for his troops, rotating them off the line to keep them fresh, creating these what he called dry houses, where they would take a house and put a whole bunch of stoves in it, light them all up, and have guys come in there, take their clothes off, dry their clothes out, and then they'd have to put them on and go back out in the rain. But he's like, even that hour of dryness was good for the men's mental health. And he's bending over backwards to prevent trench foot, which is an epidemic in the U.S. Army. 
And so I hadn't really thought about that, but you're right. They didn't attack him. They attacked north of him. So he has time to think of a plan, put it together, go on the attack. You know, yeah, he is the beneficiary of a lot of things, not only in this battle, but in World War II in general. But that's a good point you made there. You know, fascist photo up there about the fact that he's trying to prevent trench foot. He's trying to give the men some comfort because if we talk about the traditional pattern narrative, and there's lots of traditional pattern narratives, but the kind of the, you know, his guts, our blood, that kind of thing, that he doesn't care about his his people. When you're tackling, as you are, someone like General Patton, you're having to come compete with the fact that everybody reading about the book is going to come in with a preconceived idea, just like Craig Simons has written about Nimitz. Everyone's got an idea on Nimitz, haven't they? And there are certain army commanders, corps commanders, that you could do a book about that no one would have any preconceived idea about at all. In fact, they'd have barely heard of the name. So is it is it well, difficult? I'm going to say real quick, let me interrupt. Do you have any idea how many people have come to me to explain Patton to me? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's the thing. You, you, you know, you're having to strip away all the stuff people think they know pair back these versions of stories that have been built on over decades of repetition and films and movie making and and then tear it all back. And then, as you said there, start again from scratch. And so a simple question, I know we could have touched on this and we talked about Patton's uh, leadership in the, in the last show. I think we did the Mayan show in between, but the Patton leadership show. Um, Are are we, would be better off everybody kind of, having their brains washed of everything they know about Patton and starting again, would that put everybody in a better situation, do you think? Yes, but you're asking for the impossible. Yeah. It's like saying to do that with George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, the people that we've grown up or Churchill, you know, that you've grown up on all these stories and then these historians do the digging. Yes, in a perfect world, that would be it. But let's, we got to be honest, the majority of people reading military, military history are doing it for entertainment. Yeah, They're not, you know, thinking about the book they're going to write. And so it's, we just got to do the best we can do. You know, you yeah. should have me on your show every day, I think is what I'm telling you. Uh, no, definitely. I mean, if I, you should just take over and I can have a break. But there you go. Let, let's go back to Matt there, because I had a couple of questions on the sidebar about what the, if the German, the Brandenburg Division particularly, had, had preempted a, a movement north by the Third Army, when the pattern did, you said that they, he'd moved a bit after they predicted. What was their reaction to it? How did it change the way they were behaving? Because as we all know, because we've talked about it so far this week, within two or three days of December the 16th, it's, the German offensive is already running into all sorts of problems in all sorts of sectors. It's an unsustainable offensive. But do they specifically react to what pattern does? Uh eventually, I guess, would be the best answer. Now, they, I, there are probably better historians you can ask that, that know the German army and the bulge better. But, but I'll just tell you what I think a lot of us know is, you know, the main thrust is further north, you know, with Piper and, and the yeah. second SS and first SS. But it's with the um, the liberation, the relief, the link up, however you want to call it. I'm, I'm always so cautious because there's people that are so sensitive Technically, it is a relief. There's surrounded troops, a relief column comes through. But, you know, they say, oh, nobody in the 101st ever said that. I'm like, yeah, the one, the veterans you've talked to, the guys in the hospital were very happy to be relieved, you know. But um, the, 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 the retaking, the Patton's breakthrough to Bastogne, it kind of changes the center of gravity of the German attack. Because then Hitler, you know, on Hitler's orders, we're going to take back Bastogne. And so a lot of those troops that were moving east are now going down and focusing on Bastogne. And that's why they, they can't get to Hoofalese, you know, because more and more German armor is coming down. Patton's going to commit this six armored division in there to add to the fourth. Um, so, yeah, the gravity, the center of gravity of the Battle of the Bulge shifts because of Bastogne and Patton's action. And I, like I said, there's other historians that can probably speak about that much better than I can. Well, uh, well, we can we can invite them another time. But I mean, going yes, going, going back to um, you know, you, you talked about the fact that he's in Luxembourg City, so he's able to see the road network. He's able to be, kind of be the eyes and ears for his army ahead of the army. There, that's a bit of a yeah. bonus as well. I mean, you know, we've we've kind of we've we've shattered the pattern myth a little bit by saying he didn't predict the Battle of the Bulge. Um, but what do you think in that movement towards Bastogne? that you haven't already said, did you think that was a masterstroke? I mean, oh, you know, 
give, give us a couple of examples of things that he did that it's particularly his skill set that he's coming in there with. Right. Well, yeah, for as much in a way, if you strip away that myth that he predicted the bulge, it makes what he did all the more impressive because he yeah. did it all on a much shorter timetable. You know, he didn't have all this time to prepare mentally and everything. He, you know, made snap decisions. Now, his his staff does kind of give him a blueprint to go up to, to, to the meeting and for done about. But from that point on, like I said, he's in a Jeep with a radio doing this. Um, and I've got so many eyewitness accounts of soldiers talking to him, of him, you know, coming under fire uh, during this prep time. And in fact, when he gets up to Bastogne, so, you know, Bastogne's relieved on the uh, 26th. He doesn't go up there until I think it's the 30th, the day before the 31st. Yeah. And, you know, very famously. So that actually is around February or late January. Yeah, that's much later. Yeah. But yeah. So it's representative of the, of the, yeah. Yeah. And he, and he wasn't happy about this. You know, he was pursuing the Germans and he gets a call from Eisenhower and Bradley and they say, meet us in Bastogne. And he's like, this is just for a photo shoot. That's all this is, you know? And so there they are in the photo shoot. But no, he goes up in the, actually the famous pictures for that are him putting the medal on McAuliffe and, yeah. uh, what is, is it, Chip, Chipwee, how do you pronounce his last name? Chipwee, uh, everyone pronounces his name differently, doesn't it? But Steve yes. Chipwee, 502nd, Chapwee, people will correct us on the pronunciation of it. But um, I think Mark Bando said even his family disagreed about how to say his name. So, so there <laughs> we are. Well, people disagree about my name all the time, even within my family. So when some say Himmel, some say email. And then people who don't me say hi, Mel. Um, but anyway, so he goes up on December 30th. And um, and, and, and Chipwee had, had repulsed the Germans on Christmas Day. That was the last big effort the Germans had attacking from the west uh, uh, side of, the, of uh, the Bastogne area. And so Patton goes up there and he basically walks up to an artilleryman who's calling artillery on attacking German tanks. And one of the shells goes right through an open turret and blows the tank up. And Patton's like, great shooting. There's a story of a sergeant. He's with a machine gun unit. And the Germans are on the other side of the road. And they're trying to be quiet because they don't want to give their position away. And Patton comes rolling up in his Jeep with the sirens going. And the Germans hear this and run off. And, you know, so here's Patton kind of doing the soldier's job for them. Um, just, you know, he's so hands-on. Um, that I, it, like just what he did from December, from the night of December 19th to, you know, the 26th of the relief of Bastogne is so impressive. Um, one thing I also want to address, Paul, you know, they, they, the way that it's presented, people always say Patton turned his third army, you know, from attacking West to attacking North and no one had ever done this before. He moved his army. He technically doesn't move his whole army. Um, you know, he does have Jacob Devers take over some of his southern flank, so he doesn't have so much surface to cover. But he keeps one core, uh, Walton Walker's 20th Corps. He keeps them pointing east. And he says, you're basically going to defend them my base flank while I push mm -hmm. north. And it's kind of a shame because somebody's got to do it, and Walker's in the perfect position. So Walker kind of misses out on the glory of the, the grand maneuver but technically, you know, Third Army, yes, elements of Third Army do attack North, but at least one core and, and a lot of what Man Nettie does is also defending that corner of the bulge or that shoulder of the bulge. So that's another kind of myth mm. is that Patton turns his whole army really But, but turning a whole army just sounds cool, though, doesn't it? It, make, exactly. it makes it sound like, you know, every single person within that entire formation has had to do a complete maneuver, which makes it sound more impressive. And the next thing I want to touch on, again, it's this kind of idea of the popular history, is that once he gets the Baston, and Baston is the, the a liberator, or, well, relieved on December 26th, <laughs> is that somehow that's all it, isn't it? It's, it reminds me as a Brit of that when the commandos get to Pegasus Bridge in Normandy, that's it, everybody can stop. That That's just the, the first hurdle to get to. They've got to go up to the high ground in Normandy and hold off against Germans for the next three months. So well, well, again, with Patton and Baston, it seems the way these sort of quick little internet articles is that once he gets the Baston, that's it. Everything's over. We can, as you said there earlier, there's there's weeks of really quite horrible fighting and tricky situations. Uh, 
that follows. So why does that not get talked about as well? I'll tell you exactly why. And this drives me crazy because in the movie Patton, there's a scene where you see the relief of Bastogne on a map and it burns up and there's that German uh, German general and he says, it's over, it's over, das Ende, das Ende. And then he starts taking papers and throwing them in the fire and he says, I'm gonna kill myself just like Hitler. And I'm like, okay, Bastogne is December 26. Adolf Hitler kills himself April 20, 20th, I think it was, 1945. It's like, You've left that map up for six months. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. That's always driven me crazy. So in the movie, yes, once he relieves Bastogne, the war is over. You know, just as a lot of people think after we'd land in Normandy, war is pretty much over, you know. And so, and that's, Paul, that's my worry. Is any good body going to read volume three of my book? Because there's an intense, there's enough going on from January to May to fill an entire another 350 page book, yeah. you know, there's, there's, and, and I got to give Peter Kenick a lot of credit for that because we, the, the, the stereotype is the meetup at Hoofley's ends the bulge. Well, that's at the waist, you know, it's not until February 45 that we take back all the land that the Germans had taken during the battle of the bulge. So you've got that. So that takes you to February and then March is the fighting towards the Rhine River. Um, and we all kind of know what happened, Remagen Bridge, and then Patton crosses on March 22nd. Then Patton's going to launch a rescue attempt on his son-in-law that is a disaster. Then he's going to race across the rest of Germany, and he actually is going to get all the way into Czechoslovakia. So there's a lot of fighting going on here to get to that point. And it, yeah, so it does not end with Bastogne. There is a lot of brutal fighting. And I think that... that it does confuse people because you can see in your mind that turn north Bastogne, whereas, you know, once he starts fighting over the Saar River, you know, and the, those winter crossings that are so famous in Luxembourg, you know, that doesn't, that is not part of our memory. That is not part of how we look at a map. You know, wait, that's all the way over here, but we're driving north. And I think that's what throws people off. And that's why I'm trying to cover these attacks because, you know, all these books about Patton talk about Bastogne. But he is attacking closer to the base. He that is going on while this is all happening, and I'm trying to capture that in volume two and volume three. And that's interesting because Peter Caddick Adams, you know, his his new volume, Fire and Steel. So it's that it is covering his book is covering Battle of the Bulge till the end of the war in Europe. And he's you know he's going to come on in, in January and finish this series of shows by talking basically what happened next. But uh, when you read Peter's tweets and things, he's kind of half worried that, that what's the interest going to be in that last three or four months because again the same thing you're saying is like once the germans have thrown their dice with the battle of the bold it's just a matter of time then it's just a matter of just squeezing and pushing and, and as you say the next big hurdle physically and metaphorically being the rhine right but there's a hell of a lot of fighting in between the bulge and the rhine um well, you know paul i'm just thinking about this and, and maybe peter can correct me or, or phil blood or somebody else but I think that with the, the end of the war, that's when they reveal all the concentration camps. Yeah. And that narrative really takes over. And so I think that and, that, and it's such a, you know, uncomprehensible thing to see these factories of death, that that's what fills the newsreel. So maybe that is an element of why we kind of squeeze out things after the bulge. And, and just, I, I hope to God, Peter Caddick Adams doesn't write another little tiny thin book. I'm so sick of those. Yeah, those you know, little pamphlets that yeah, he does. That he yeah, yeah, no, it's a, now my, my, my post lady, I think, has had several operations on her back since I've moved into Bayer, I think. <laughs> the look on her face when I go down, it's another bloody heavy book. And I want to go, it's a Peter Caddick Adams. <laughs> you know, so, there's a forklift truck coming down with the book in there. But no, it's, um, it's interesting. I'm. Uh, we've got some questions. We'll kind of do some things now about just kind of wrap things up. So yep. uh, Rainier, who's coming on and talking about the medics and for the could Kevin, please com comment on General Milliken's role. I'm really glad he mentioned that. Milliken comes into the theater completely green. Uh, he's going to take over third core. And Patton mentions in his diaries and letters, like, I don't trust it. But I didn't say I didn't trust him. I'd rather have an experienced Corps commander than this green guy. His credentials are fine, but he's not one of us. And, you know, and the idea is that he's going to, you know, 
break through the front and then let Middle Milliken take the offensive. But yet, because of events, Milliken takes center stage. And so it's kind of thrust upon him. And Patton comes away very impressed with Milliken's ability to move his core north. And Fox can, you know, Don Fox can talk about it better, the relationship with Fourth Armored. But uh, no, Patton is very, very doubtful of this commander and becomes very, very impressed with him. Well, that's a good response to that. And folks, if you've got any more questions now, but other if so f- file them in the sidebar there, but I'll keep on talking to Kevin and wait for some more questions. But you know, again, this back to this idea of the fact we're all caught up in the movie version of things, the 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 the, the internet legends versions of things like that. It, it is important to understand the truth. Because as you say, the truth is more interesting than than the the myths we've been carrying on with i mean and it's you know it's fair to say i said in my introduction there that you you both admire pattern and there's things about pattern that drive you crazy because with someone like that that that's going to be how it is isn't it i mean he's yeah. he's a very complicated person and to say that you people always ask me are you a pattern fan or not and it's too binary isn't it it's too uh, well it, i used to be a pattern fan when i was young i saw the movie i so what i tell people now is i'm fascinated with pattern you know, yeah. I, I'll stop and read anything with Patton's name on it. But I, I always say, you know, if you want to study him with tactics and strategy, he's brilliant. But if you want to study him around, about well, social change. <laughs> yeah, he's not leading the way with social change. Oh, he's yes. not a pioneer in that regard, shall we say. Um, there's, yeah. Yeah, you know, I'll address this one, too. The, the, the stereotype is that they meet in this barracks. And it's really cold and there's a little stove there churning away. Some accounts say it was a school that he went to. Man, it's a giant red brick building. I, I was taking it to, so that this is Bradley's headquarters in Verdun. And I got there one year and I asked the tourism people, you know, where's Bradley's headquarters? And they sent me down to this building and nothing seemed right. So I went to the National Archives. I found photographs of Patton's, I think it was Eagle, Maine or Eagle Tech. And, um, and then I went back and I was showing those photographs to the girls behind the counters at, at uh, Verdun in the visitor center. And one girl says, I know exactly where that is. That's a, that's a military base. My dad served there. And so she drew me a map and I drove up to this place. It is enormous. It's got guard houses out front. There's a gate around it. They'll tell you it's a chaussée, which I think is French cavalry uh, headquarters. Yeah. And, and you look in the courtyard and there's a Sherman tank, which is always a giveaway that something happened in World War II here. It's like a four-story tall building. It's red brick. It's beautiful. That's where the meeting took place. I've talked to one staffer who was there. He did say it was kind of cold. Some people did leave their coats on. But this idea of the meeting in like a little schoolhouse or, you know, an old ancient barracks. No, 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 no. This was one of Bradley's headquarters. It was a cavalry, you know, post in France and very impressive. Good. And I'm, it just reminded me when you talk about your research you've done recently, is it, it touching on what we said earlier on? If you go to archives or you travel in Europe or you go to places in the USA and you're meeting people perhaps under 30 or 40 who are manning these facilities and in charge of the archives, the chances are they haven't got that baggage of a perception. So you go in there and saying researching that they're not going to be the ones to say, Kevin, let me tell you about general pattern. Whereas our age group and up, everybody's got an opinion and they've got mm-hmm. an opinion on Montgomery. So in probably going and speaking to younger people, they just haven't got that baggage. They're just going to listen to what you say and give the information they have accordingly without coloring it with an interpretation. Well, I'll tell you, the, the folks at Library of Congress, Manuscripts Room, and that's where Patton's papers are, so professional, so helpful. You know, they'll, Patton will mention an obscure person. They'll run off and research them for me. And what they did during the pandemic, and this is where I really got to give them props, they took the original diaries and transcribed them. And they, it's all online. So you can see what Patton really said, you know, instead of relying on these typed out you know, and, and for volume one, I relied on the typed out ones. I, I may have made some serious mistakes. It's going to take some young historian flicking through my book who says, I think Mr. Hemel's wrong. I've looked through those diaries. I know this kid, uh, uh, Peter Metz, he's about eight years old. I think he knows more about World War II than I do. And so he's probably going to end up writing the next patent book. But um, yeah, it, it's relying on those professionals. It's having that open mind. And, you know, 
Paul, there's so many stories in my first volume. I never thought I'd come across them. I was just trying to find stories. And then I'm finding these eyewitness accounts saying, hey, this was fake. This never happened. And I have, and I, I check them out and like what they're saying is legit. I, therefore I got to put it in. And so I didn't have this brilliant idea to re rewrite the book on Patton. I was just trying to write a more detailed book on Patton. And as a result, I find all this stuff out of what's real and what's not. Which, which is to your credit. And it says it, we talk about this on, on the show generally is that we are in that era. We are in the era where people are bringing the new, the re revisionist, which is, I think it was Robert Lyman or someone said the other recently that how, why do we refer to revisionist as a dirty word? Revisionist means you're saying something new. If it's not revisionist, it's repeating something that's already been said. So to me, by definition, I want to read books that are revisionist. Otherwise, there's no point me having forked out the $25 pounds, euros on it if it's just yep. repeating what I've already been spoon fed. We need our history to be revisionist. So um, any, while we're in the middle, you know, 77 years ago, this was the Ardennes. Anything else? Because, you know, you're a tour guide as well. You're a historian. Anything else that kind of annoys you about perhaps how Europe talks about the Ardennes or how Americans, any kind of other things that you feel we should move on from or myths or things not necessarily concerning General Patton? Right. Um, well, you know, just when you were saying that, it cracked me up because you can see all the books behind me. And I've got a ton of Patton books that so many of them say the same thing. And that was another motivation to write the book was I was reading all these different books on Patton, you know, but they, they were all relying on the same sources. Yeah. And, you know, you always hear that, how he, he, he brought discipline to second core and they would cite like one thing. And so I was like, no, I'm sure he did more. And so I found tons of incidents and, and you're right. That's what I want to read new stuff. I don't want to regurgitation. And then, but then, you know, what you're fighting against, you're fighting against publishers that say, oh, it's been done to death. You know, I remember when I wrote a, the article on Breakcore Manor and Carl Nam with the Matt, with uh, WW2 History Magazine, he said, oh, come on, Kevin, Breakcore has been done to death. I said, Carl, nothing's been written on Breakcore Manor since the book, Band of Brothers. You know, there was a mini series, but nobody's written. And to my knowledge, nobody's written about Breakcore Manor since I wrote that article. Uh, spoken a lot about it a bit, and uh, it's one of the reasons <laughs> I'm deliberately not doing a show about that because everyone will come in it saying that they've been. We're going to we love it with you, Kevin. You always go down these rabbit holes, but I, I am not touching much easy company stuff generally because you what get that thing where awesome. everybody says, But Don Malarkey told me this, or Bill Garney, <laughs> because they met them for 15 <laughs> seconds at an air show 20 years ago. And it's not, you know, people who had a chance to meet these people, fantastic. But I feel that when you're talking about that with some kind of authority and that I did walk across those places with Bill Gardner and, and you have been there, Stephen Ambrose Dawes done, is that people doubt your credentials over their 15 seconds they spent or the letter <laughs> they got from, and you think, why are you, this is not a like for like comparison. That conversation you had was fantastic. But we're looking at documents. We're looking at what these guys said 30 years ago. It's just, I, I'm, I'm using this to kind of bear, my, you know, re, get it off my chest. But, um, you know, it's really funny you say that because I'll never forget on one of my tours, we were at uh, Point de Hoc and we're, we're, I'm getting ready to give my talk. And this woman on the tour said, well, you know, they got up there and the guns weren't there. And, and, and I, and I got caught, like I froze and I'm like, wait, no, that's, and I realized she had read Cornelius Ryan's book from the 1960s and here we are in 2014 or something and she and and it was such an archaic story that i froze i'm like well everybody knows that's not true but you're right you deal with the people that with that that their little nugget of history that they're so proud of that they know and well what do you know you know i, I haven't read your books you know just because you've been a tour guide for 15 years yeah. you know ugh, that's yeah. something we're always going to be fighting against I think so. But we've got a question from, from Neil Lawrence, a friend of the show, an old friend of mine, but I'll kind of ask it a different way. And it's about, did the German high command fear Patton? But what I'm going to say is, is what do the German archives say about General Patton? What, 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 when you go to Europe, do they say about General Patton, both at the time during World War II and post World War II? Is their view of him different to the American and allied view or, or largely the same? So I will say this, because I really haven't 
done a lot of German research. But what I've done is I have read memoirs, uh, particularly, I guess, Joseph Goebbels' diaries. And just like with the Americans, the Germans would say, First Army's attacking here, Patton's Third Army is doing this. Yeah. You know, they, they wouldn't even mention Bradley. You know, the Allies, the, the British are doing this and Patton's doing that. You know, it was like that, that go to name that was iconic, even on the other side of the line. That's the best I got. Okay, well, that's a, that's a good answer. Yeah. So, um, for, for, so any any other quick myths about the the Ardennes, the Battle of the Bowls that you want to get off your chest before we bring this to an end? <laughs> no, I think I'm good. I and you know what, my sister Beth is visiting from Philadelphia, and I got to get her on a train. So okay, yeah, well, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll end it then. No problem at all. So I'll just remind people what's coming up, and I'll come back and say goodbye in a second. So, folks. Tomorrow evening, don't forget, we're a bit early. It's 6 p.m. UK time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. We've got Don M. Fox coming on talking about the 4th Armoured Division. So this is a, a deeper dive into what Kevin's been talking about today. And then the following day, uh, Lieutenant Colonel William Nance is coming on to talk about cavalry groups, which will be really amazing. That's an aspect of the Battle of the Bulge we don't know about. Reminding everybody, of course, don't forget to share, share what we're doing on social media. Consider becoming a patron. Join the channel. Buy Kevin's book, the first volume. Link is in the description below. Uh, look for his articles in all over the place, all sorts of magazines, things online. There's more things of Kevin talking on YouTube, C-SPAN lectures, all sorts of things in front of various places because um, he's always good value. But other than that, I'll bring him back in and I'll say thank you very much for joining me, Kevin. So um, um, happy Christmas and we will see you in the new year when we can talk about um, something else. <laughs> Uh, we haven't thought about it yet, but we'll do. Wanna, we'll think of something else. If you want to talk Patton or something else, I'm always happy. I love being on your show. You're my friend, and anything I can do to help you out, I'm doing it. Cheers. Well, that's Cheers. brilliant then. Okay, okay thank man. you very much. So, folks, this is Paul Woodhouse for World War Two TV saying I'll see you all tomorrow evening. Don't forget, we're one hour earlier. Cheers, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye. <laughs>